We're going to start with now with our uh, next speaker, our first speaker at this part of the session. Um, as you see here too, we have the table set up because we're going to have a panel discussion at the end of the um, of the talks. So it'll be before, like in the last 15 minutes. Um, and so our next speaker is Sarah Ruan from AMH. Great, I just want to start off by saying thanks so much to the organizers of this symposium and SSB and BAPSLA, I think is how it's pronounced, for getting me down here and for funding. Um, so what I'm going to be talking about now to kind of coincide with the last talk is gene tree species tree discordance in an empirical data set rather than theoretical. So we know from simulations from a whole bunch of people, a lot of people who are here, a lot of people who aren't here, and from a lot of the speakers I've seen during a lot of the sessions during this meeting, that a couple of things about gene trees and species trees. So the two that I kind of want to talk about today specifically, but with empirical data, are gene trees are known to overestimate divergence times, and then the other thing is that gene trees, if they don't match your species trees, you're probably going to need a lot of uh, loci in order to compensate for that. And so I don't want to imply that people, other people haven't done empirical work that illustrates some of these concepts or other concepts with species tree, tree, spe gene tree species tree discordance, but I want to tell you about how this works using a couple of data sets specifically from snakes. So all I'm going to talk about is snakes during this uh, session. So I hope that's what you really came for. So the first thing I'm going to talk about is related to this overestimation of divergence times when you're using gene species reps, gene trees rather than species trees. So what I'm going to talk about for this data set are milk snakes. So this is what I had worked on for my dissertation. And just to give a little bit of background before I go into the nuts and bolts of the discordance, so for a long time milk snakes were considered this one species. And not just a single species in the United States, but a single species that ranges all the way from eastern Canada or southeastern Canada throughout the United States, throughout Central America, getting all the way to the southern extent in Ecuador. And these snakes are considered oftentimes exemplars in Batesian mimicry studies. If you take a look at the snake that's right here, the scarlet king snake, which is, was part of milk snakes, this is a really nice example of a snake that's often used or considered a coral snake mimic. Um, the other thing is that even though this one looks great as a mimic, these snakes are incredibly morphologically variable. And I couldn't really give a talk about milk snakes, even though they're not quite the focus, without going through some of this really cool morphology that they have with respect to color pattern. So if we take a look at some of the variation you see in these snakes, you might be shocked to think anyone ever thought they were a single species. So you've got these kind of drabber ones, orange colored ones, ones that are, are really bright orange. You've got snakes that are red and ringed. You've got snakes that are actually all black as adults. Those snakes in Costa Rica and Panama start off tricolored as babies and only turn black as they reach maturity. And then, of course, our beautiful little scarlet king snake example here. So these snakes have a crazy amount of color pattern variation. And so it's a little bit surprising they've been considered one species, but it's thought maybe they were hybridizing in, as they came into contact with one another. Prior studies on milk snake that started to hint that maybe this wasn't the case showed a couple of different things. First off, lack of monophyly for milk snakes. So these guys are in the genus Lampropeltis. And some studies that have looked at the genus Lampropeltis, but not focused specifically on these milk snakes, have found that they're not monophyletic as a clade or as a group within that genus. They're spread out among some of the other snakes in there, especially some of the king snakes, which are milk snakes and king snakes are what comprise Lampropeltis. The other thing that's sort of interesting about these prior studies is that the divergence times when these trees are dated and including milk snakes show that for the genus Lampropeltis, you've got a lot of divergence times that take place during the Miocene. And this is not shocking, but a little surprising that so many of them are so old because we think in North America, as well as in Central and South America, that more recent Pleistocene glacial cycles may have played a big part in causing speciation, and so these would predate that. So that's a little bit surprising. But the two things, these two things, um, have only been illustrated using data sets that are using gene trees and not really species trees. So that's a bit of a caveat considering how much we actually know about how this can cause problems. So why do gene trees actually overestimate divergence times? 
So there's been some, again, some simulation work as well as some empirical work that kind of illustrates this. But the reason for this is that genes are typically that variation that's there. It often is taking place or diverging prior to the divergence of the species. So if we've got three loci or genes here, A, B, and C, we've got species one, species two, that range of genetic divergence is taking place prior to the time of speciation for those. And so that's what causes this sort of phenomenon of having gene trees if you're making a dated tree of some sort. If it's based on a gene tree and not a species tree, it's not taking this into account because it doesn't explicitly model this. On the plus side, a lot of coalescent methods that we're now using more and more, something like Starbase, is able to deal with this particular problem. So I'm not gonna go into the delimitation of the milk snakes. And for any snake people in the audience, I'll point out that one of the snakes here is not a milk snake, it's an alternate, it's a gray banded king snake, but it happened to be in this figure for other reasons. Um, but we have seven versus one species now. That brings us, at the time that I was working on this, to a total of 21 species in the genus Lampropeltis. Some work that's come out since, or that'll be coming out soon, will show that there's probably a few more than that. And now that we've got sort of a handle on how many species are there in the genus Lampropeltis, we've added these six additional species through uh, delimiting milk snakes, we can look at how do the divergence times, we can kind of go back to those previous studies that show the Miocene times, how do these divergence times using gene tree and species tree methods compare with one another for the genus Lampropeltis? So I constructed two trees using same taxa, same individuals, so the same 21 species, the same outgroups, the same exact individuals, in fact, so the same numbers of loci for everybody. The same fossil priors and parameterizations, and I want to point out that these fossil priors and parameterizations also matched the prior studies that dated this group. And then the same 10 loci. So this was based on 10 nuclear uh, DNA, uh, 10 nuclear loci. The mitochondrial loci in this group show some signs of introgression, so that sort of violates the assumptions if you're gonna use a program like Starbeast. So those were removed from this particular analysis. And I did two things. I made a concatenated tree in Beast, and then I made a species tree in Starbeast using all these particular taxa, priors, and loci. And again, all for the same individuals. And so if we take a look at how this breaks down, specifically for the timing of the extant divergence events, and compare the species tree to that concatenated gene tree, we see that when it's a species tree, we actually have mostly Pleistocene speciation events. And when we're using that concatenated gene tree in beast, we're getting some Pleistocene, but almost entirely Pliocene, uh, speciation events. It's much higher. So definitely a little bit older. And I know I mentioned that these prior studies that had a lot of Miocene divergence events, keep in mind I've now added an additional six species to that tree and they're a little bit younger anyway. So you're going to have that push, push uh, closer to the future even in the concatenated gene tree a little bit. So it's not a direct comparison to that older study because there's just more taxa here. And if we look at how this really breaks down, we have almost twice as many divergences in the Pleistocene for the species tree when compared to that concatenated gene tree. And then we're having less and less as we go further back in time with five uh, in the Pliocene, one in the Miocene, versus 10 and two in the Pliocene and Miocene. And if we take a look, at the gamma statistics. So if you're not familiar with gamma statistics, this is just kind of a simple way to take a look at how, if you take a tree and you look at when most of the divergence events are occurring, where most of the nodes are, you can have nodes that are sort of clustered in the past, you can have nodes that are clustered very close to the present, and then you can have nodes that are distributed evenly across the tree. And one of the things that we found in this particular study is that the gamma statistic when um, you're making a species tree and you run it through there, you find that the nodes are really distributed pretty evenly throughout the tree. There's not any real big signal for really recent diversification or really old diversification. But when you take a look at that concatenated tree, you get again a signal that most of the divergence times have occurred more in the past, that there's maybe been this early burst of speciation and that it's slowed as we go towards the present. So that's another discrepancy between the two, the gene tree and the species tree here with respect to timing of divergence. 
If we look at how those dates and those nodes are distributed, here we can see that the mean dates of the concatenated tree are significantly older than the mean dates of the species tree using just a simple Wilcoxon ring test. Um, the species tree distribution, I don't know how well you can see this from in the back, but the species tree distribution, those dates are distributed much closer towards the present here, whereas the concatenated tree, you, can have, you have them going quite a bit further back in time. So again, we're seeing more divergence times in the past rather than towards the present. In addition, one of the really interesting things um, with respect to these dates is that the difference in the mean times, which I'm referring to here on the y-axis as branching time error, one of the really interesting things that we see here is that that difference in mean times, that error, is greater here towards more recent divergence events. So the more recently we look at the difference between the dates, so the, the more recent nodes between the concatenated tree and the species tree, the greater that discrepancy between the times is. And as you go further and further towards the past, it's not quite as big of a deal. It's still a problem, they're still not the same, but you're having a bigger problem towards the present rather than the past in this particular data set. So that wraps up the first part of this, which is about um, some of this milk snake work and divergence times with species trees. But the next thing that I'm going to talk about here is some of the stuff that I'm working on right now. And so we're going to shift from these new world snakes to some old world snakes. So I'm going to talk here about gene tree species tree discordance in small and large data sets. And when I talk about small data sets during this portion, I'm sort of talking about Sanger sequencing, but that's not to say somebody showed in this session 75, an example of 75 loci that was a Sanger data set. So I'm not implying you can't sequence tons and tons and tons of genes that way, but typically we're, when we're talking about more than 40 or 50 or 60 or 100 loci now, we're really talking about next gen data sets. So I'm gonna refer to the Sanger data set as small, but with the caveat, of course, it could be large. So the snakes that I'm working on right now are pseudoxyrophenes, which are mainly found in Madagascar. There's a couple species that you get in Africa and one that you get in Socotra. But they're mainly, uh, the ones in Madagascar appear to be a monophyletic radiation there, and they're mostly Malagasy. And all the ones in Madagascar, with the exception of a possible introduction, are endemic. There's about 85 species described right now, and this is about 80% of the Malagasy snake fauna. So there's a couple other things kicking around Madagascar. There's some boas, there's some typhlopids, those little worm or blind snakes, but most of the snakes there are pseudoxybrophenes. So these are the snakes that are filling up all that niche space, all that diversity, and while this portion of the talk also isn't specifically about that, I'm gonna point out how amazingly diverse these snakes are because I have a lot of really cool photos of them and they're really, really amazing. Such as this one right here that I'm illustrating. This is uh, Langaha madagascariensis, which has this amazing nasal appendage that you don't really see in any other genus of snake. Um, nobody knows what it's for. This is actually a female because their nasal appendage is sexually dimorphic. So there's a lot of really cool snakes in this group. Previous work on these snakes has included, as far as molecular work goes, included up to about 40% of the species. And the systematics has been pretty unclear just because you're not really including that much of the diversity in this. And what we want to do, some of the main goals of this project are first, let's infer a really great, really complete, robust species tree. Because without that tree and knowing the relationships, it's not really valid or potentially accurate if you're going to do some sort of downstream analyses. So we want to ultimately look at some of the biogeography. When did these snakes get to Madagascar? Um, are they really a monophyletic radiation? Is there any dispersal back to Africa? As well as diversification. How do we get snakes that look like this? And without having that species tree to start with, that's sort of hard to do. So the sampling and sequencing strategy in this study is basically you want to sample all the described species if you can. Some of them are known from one or two or three specimens, but we're doing our best with a lot of field work to get them all. Sanger sequencing for five loci in all individuals. So right now we're at about 650 pseudoxyrophenes in our data set. And I've been sequencing five loci that are pretty commonly used in squamate phylogenetics. This is helping us do two things. One, it's helping us recognize any cryptic diversity that there might be in the group. 
So things, there's a lot of unexplored areas of Madagascar. There's a lot of snakes that haven't been described, even if they're known to be sort of different. So we're not able to necessarily send everything out for next-gen sequencing. And so by doing the Sanger sequencing first and just getting an idea of where there might be cryptic or hidden diversity or areas that look particularly interesting with respect to genetic diversity, that way we're able to get them all in there. For the NGS data, we're actually using the anchored phylogenomics technique of the lemons. And initially we sent out 25 taxa to see how this works. This represents almost all the genera in Madagascar for pseudoxyrophenes. We've got 350 more that based on that Sanger sequencing, we've sort of chosen to send along and they're done. They're just kind of being uh, going through the bioinformatics pipeline at this point. This is a data set that targets about 400 loci, and I'm going to break down what that looks like a little bit more. So if we've got these 25, I'm waiting on the 350 to get back. I've got the Sanger data for all the same individuals that I've got the NGS data for. What can I do with this data while I'm waiting to get the rest of the, the data back? These data. Uh, current pseudoxyrophine data that I have, how do generic phylogenies for this group compare using different data sets and different tree inference methods? So this is just another nice example of some of that really amazing morphological diversity that you see in those snakes. So what I did with the data that I currently have is I took those 25 taxa, that includes two outgroups and 23 pseudoxyrophines, and I have the anchored loci and the sanger loci, and if we see how this breaks down, the number of loci ultimately for the anchored data set is 377, so almost 400. The Sanger is two mitochondrial genes and three nuclear genes. The number of base pairs is half a million versus just under 3,000. Uh, the percent missing data is pretty comparable. It's about 2% 2 for, 2 for both. And then the pairwise divergence, if you take a look at how different um, or how informative the genes are that we're using. It ranges from a little less than 1% all the way up to about 12 for the anchored loci, and for the Sanger loci, about 2% to 20. So those mitochondrial genes, CO1 and CYP, are really pushing the uh, pairwise divergence up for the Sanger data set. So then we've got all this data, we've got comparable data, the same taxa for both groups, and what I want to do is compare using both a variety of methods and varying numbers of loci, what kind of trees do we get? If we start making species trees for these, what kind of trees do you get? What kind of data do you need to answer a question here? So the tree inference methods, I think by now a lot of people are pretty familiar with a lot of these, so I'm not gonna go into great detail, but just to give a brief overview on them. Summary stats methods that I used are STAR and MPST. These use gene trees. These are coalescent-based methods, but rather than using the sequence data directly, you have to put the gene trees in, so you have to estimate the gene trees separately. It assumes your gene trees are accurate, so that's a pretty big assumption and something that could potentially be a problem. The really nice thing about this, though, particularly for NGS data, is that you can have hundreds of loci, and you can have hundreds of taxa, and you can get the answer to this very, very quickly. So that's one of the huge advantages to it. And there are other nice summary stats methods as well that I've seen people talking about here. So these aren't the only ones out there. Concatenation. Now, it's probably, I would be the first person to say, concatenation is statistically inconsistent. It might not give you the right answer. But we all know that it's fast and easy. And when you first get a data set and you want to get some idea what your tree looks like, you're very tempted to just concatenate it and see what you get. So I figured, why not try it? See what it looks like here. It's not a species tree method, so it's not going to be modeling some of the things that we might worry about, such as incomplete lineage sorting. Under certain conditions, though, there's definitely evidence that you get an accurate topology, so it's not necessarily a waste or something not to do. And then, of course, I, would, I don't want to say everybody's favorite species tree method, but one that I really like to use is Star Beast. It's robust, even with few loci sometimes. Um, it can be, I've seen simulations that show even four to eight loci can give you the right answer. There's a really nice empirical paper by Harris et al. from 2014 on chickadees that shows that 15 seems to be a really good number for star beasts to start performing well when you compare it to really big data sets. So I'm gonna say 15 loci might, might work okay. It's computationally intensive. So this is the big drawback and why you're not using it with your next gen data. 
And it's not really useful whether you have hundreds of loci, but you also can't have hundreds of taxa as well. And so what I did was I took this NGS data and the Sanger data, and I broke it down using all these different methods. So the NGS data, it's great for the summary stats methods. It might work well for concatenation, I don't know, but I figured why not give it a try. The Sanger data, there's certainly evidence that the summary stats methods might need more loci, but I have the data here, so I figured why not try it? And a lot of people have smaller data sets. You wanna know what's gonna work and what new methods may or may not work well. And then the NGS data, you might not be able to put in all 400 loci, but with 25 taxa, you can take 15 of those loci and see how that works out. And so that's what I did here. So for the NGS loci, I did all 377 random subsets to see how does it compare if we're using more of a Sanger or a smaller style data set. So anywhere from 3 to 200. And then random subsets of 15 loci for Starby specifically for that anchored data. And these were all replicated five times each. So 200 obviously is with replacement if I only have 400. But for the uh, star beast analyses, those were 15 different loci each time randomly chosen. So that's not based on informativeness or length or anything like that. The Sanger data, I did three. I did just the nuclear. I did four using one mitochondrial in the three nuclear, and then all five. And if we just see how this sort of looks in a little bit of a, a breakdown, what programs I used for each one, and Pest and Star for all the NGS subsets and the full data set. For Star Beast, NGS has to be just those 15. You can do more, but I was just seeing how does it work with 15 compared to 377. And the concatenation, let's throw all 377 in there and see what happens. Um, for the Sanger data, I did M Pest and Star with five, four, and three. And then I ran Star Beast using all five because that's probably what you do in reality. And then the same thing with concatenation. Why not use all five and see what happens? The comparisons, I used Robinson Folds distances to compare the tree topologies. And rather than use the straight up distance, this is a relative percentage. So it's a little bit more comparable across different trees or across different methods. So, if you came here for the snakes and you wanted to know something about how Malagasy snakes relate to each other, what I can tell you here is here's a phylogeny that shows all those genera along with the outgroups. And we find that if you use all the anchored loci or you use any of those 15 locust subsets in Star Beast, you end up getting an RF distance of 0%. All these trees are identical, whether you concatenate that data, um, with the anchored data set. Whether you use star beast with 15 or you use the summary stats methods, you get this really nice phylogeny that in general is really highly supported What for all the different methods. And the same nodes have the same low support regardless of which method you use. Pseudoxy growth feeds in this tree are in fact monophyletic, and we have evidence here. One of the pseudoxy growth feeds in this is Duberia, which is one of those African taxa, and so it's outside of the Malagasy radiation, so that's really nice to get some sort of confirmation for this. And there's really high bootstrap support for a lot of the previous taxonomic hypotheses people have proposed based a lot on morphology. So this is kind of a, a nice confirmation that the morphology in this case really does help along with um, the molecular data in a really integrative way. If we take a look at comparing just those NGS subsets for the RF distances, this might be a little bit harder to see than I would have expected, but, oops, oh, go back. Okay, um, we can see here that when we're at three, four, five, 10, 25, up until you hit about 50, you're gonna have a lot of bouncing around. Your trees aren't gonna be consistently well estimated compared to the 377 locust tree. Um, once you hit 50, you sort of plateau out. So I want to point out that those 50, 100, or 200, some of those are 0% difference, but because these are averages, none of, some of them are higher. So it's just kind of a luck of the draw whether you're picking the low side that are giving you zero versus not. And all the discordance, once you hit 50 where that starts bouncing around, it's just one node that flips between one particular spot, and it's the snake here of the Afolodophis. If we take a look at how do those Sanger trees compare to that 377 uh, locust data set, don't focus too much on the stuff that's gray, that's not so awesome. What's really good here is if you use all five loci, that's as close as you're going to get and you have to use star beast in this circumstance in order to get there. So it's still not an identical topology, but it's 10%. I think that on this tree that's about two nodes 
moving around the tree. And so it's not really that bad. And you could probably get better if you added just a few more loci in there. So the uh, last sort of, this isn't really an analysis, but a visualization I want to show is if we compare what do those gene trees versus that 377 species tree look like? Um, this doesn't look as good up here as it looks on my computer because it's a little bit, uh, not pixelated, but hard to see. Um, those five Sanger loci, this is a tree of trees that shows how they relate. So the five Sanger loci, if the species tree is here, each of those Sanger loci is branching off from it. None of them are identical to the species tree. And if you take 50 of those NGS loci, and it doesn't matter which 50 you take, I replicated this for the entire thing, um, none of them are identical to the species tree as well, although you get pretty close with a lot of them. So you're getting a lot of the same nodes coming up over and over and over and over and over again. So the gene trees in this case do not equal the species tree, no matter how many loci you have in there. So what methods do you want to use in order to make a reliable phylogeny? That's what we all really want to know. We want to know how many loci do you need to do it. So for the summary methods, 50 loci or more, you're getting basically equivalent trees. You need a lot of loci to do that. At 50, you're probably going to start looking at NGS data and not necessarily doing Sanger sequencing at this point. And you're assuming your gene trees are perfect, and that's a whole other talk that I'm not giving today. Um, concatenation, under the right circumstances, you are maybe going to get an equivalent topology, so that's great when you take a first look at your data. You're still going to have problems, as I mentioned earlier, with things like divergence times, you're not taking into account incomplete lineage sorting, etc., all the problems we sort of know about. For star bees, 15 loci seems to be about equivalent for um, the summary stats methods when you're using 50 or more loci. So if you have a smaller data set, this might be the way to go. You can't use many taxa or loci though. So if you have 15 loci, but you've got 500 taxa, you're still gonna run into this problem again. So depending on the method that you're using, hundreds of loci might not be necessary, but this is probably a, a product of the diversification rates of your group, how old are they, things like that. So it's not really a one size fits all sort of problem or solution for that matter. And so what I really want to conclude with here is that now is really the time, and especially if you've seen a lot of the talks here at this meeting, we know a lot about how methods perform both theoretically and empirically. And of course, we're going to know more in the future, but there's a lot of information out there right now about how we could be getting good species tree estimates or good divergence time estimates and getting accurate topologies for the organisms that we're interested in. And this is sort of... If you think about this, and everybody thinks about this, not all questions require the same kind of data sets. If we're talking about molecular data, what you're going to use for looking between populations might not be what you're looking at at deep time scales. And similar to that sort of thought, not all data sets really are going to use the same method. And so I would say if you're starting a study now, you should not just think about what kind of data you need, you should think about what kind of methods would you use to answer the questions you're interested in with that sort of data. And so ultimately I think choosing the right data types and the right methods simultaneously as early as possible when you're running analyses is really the way to go with um, the kind of data we've got available to us now. And so there's a lot of people who collaborated on this work, I think, Frank's the only one here, but a lot of other people who are back in the U.S. right now. And funding, I want to thank everybody who contributed to helping me get here, the organizers of this symposium, and everybody who's helped or contributed to the field work. And I don't know if I have time for a question, but if I do, I'd be happy to take one. starting to get accurate. If you're using just three random loci, a lot of the nodes come across as unstable. Once you start hitting around five though, you do see that in particular where I showed that there is some lower support for that one node and that there's this one axon that bounces around, it really is that one particular node that seems to be causing the problem. There's another node on that tree that also is a little bit problematic and no, although you find it in the same um, place topologically almost every time in the different methods, the bootstrap support or the um, posterior probabilities if it's in Starbies 
never ever get high. They're always hovering somewhere in the 50s or 60s. Um, one of the things that I think is going to be really helpful moving through this project is that as we add, in this particular example, these are 25 taxa that are not, you don't have multiple individuals or multiple species per genus. I think as we add in more individuals per species and per genus that that maybe is going to help stabilize some of these problems and that's sort of based on my 650 samples that I have just the Sanger data for, and I see that you start to get really consistent placement, even with low numbers of loci, when you've got more individuals for some of those nodes. So yeah, there, there's really these sort of problematic nodes that I think people come across in a lot of their own studies, and that's one of the problems that I'm